Hello and welcome to the second journal webinar from ASA, CSA, and CSSA featuring the plant genome. I'm your moderator, David Turkemunne, the current science communications editor for the plant genome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. We are excited to continue this new webinar series, which will be held every two months and will feature authors and research published in our society journals. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that questions can be entered in the Q&A uh, Q section, and we will address them all at the end of the presentation. The webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be emailed to all attendees in the next few days. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Christian Adam, who will speak about his research, where uh, he and co-authors investigated if somatic mutations accumulate within kinetics, and thereby provide a plausible explanation for the observed decline in the quality of quality over time. The research was published in the March 2022 issue of the Plant Genome. Christian is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. And he's studying genetics and mutation with an uh, energetic passion for advancing cannabis research, while also striving to incorporate the latest biotechnology. He desires to discover and recommend best practices for the preservation of elite cultivars in cannabis. Christian. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate the uh, kind introduction. So I will go and share my screen now. All right. Uh, if someone can't see the slide, just let me know. But I believe everything should be in place. Yeah. So. Awesome. Again, thank you, David, for the kind introduction. Um, the title of my presentation today is Intraplant Genetic Diversity in Cannabis, a uh, clone, not a clone. Uh, again, my name is Christian Adamic. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Guelph, and my advisors are Dr. Max Jones and Dr. David Turkomende. So I will get into my presentation with a quick introduction. I uh, just wanted to kind of touch base on the many uses that cannabis has. Um, as some people aren't aware, some people kind of focus on the, uh, the medicinal aspect, but um, it has uh, many, many different uses uh, from medicines all the way to livestock feeds. Um, so I just want to have a quick slide to you know, show that this is a very versatile and useful plant. Um, next, I want to throw some uh, big billion dollar numbers at you, um, you know, maybe <laughs> catch your eye if you aren't aware, cannabis is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, on the figure on the left, you can see um, since legalization in Canada in 2018, uh, it's been estimated around $11 billion has uh, been sold. Um, and then on the figure to the right is uh, the US cannabis retail sales. Um, which is also at projections, um, and that goes from 20 to 30 billion all the way up to 50 billion and estimated in 2026. So uh, now I'll kind of get into more of the actual pl uh, plant background and what you know relates to the research that I've done. Um, so to start with, uh, cannabis is primarily a dioecious annual plant. Um, there's both male and female, um, and essentially um, primarily in uh, facilities, they use females because that's where you get the high concentrations of the inflorescence and the trichomes, um, which is uh, for the drug type uh, cultivars, it's where, you know, the, um, the main chemicals T or THC and CBD are produced. Um, so this is usually propagated uh, from mother plants that assures um, that female plants are maintained and that males are not introduced into the propagation space as males will introduce pollen and therefore pollinate the uh, females, which will then produce seeds, which uh, results in lowered cannabinoid levels. So the propagation is usually taken from a mother plant and it's usually taken from this kind of top apical area. So this is kind of the area where uh, these clones would kind of come from. So on the right, you see a mother plant and on the left, you see clonal cuttings. So these mother plants are maintained as perennials. Um, cannabis is naturally an annual species. Um, but essentially, um, mother plants are kept in an indefinite uh, vegetative state to allow multiple clonal cuttings to be taken. 
So another big reason why this is done is that the genetic variability is greatly reduced um, by taking propagules like clonal cuttings versus if you were to use seed seedlings. So I want to quickly touch again uh, for anyone who might not be aware what the annual versus perennial growth cycle is like. So like I mentioned, annual is naturally a annual where you start with your seed, you have vegetative growth, the flowering, and then a death with seeds being produced. Um, and that cycle kind of goes on for usually around a year or whatever the uh, plant is uh, depending. So a few months to a year usually. So that's where it gets its annual name. Uh, in the case of perennials, you start with your seed, you have vegetative growth, flowering, and then dormancy stages. And this can be repeated many times uh, lasting you know, years as you see in many, many tree species. Um, so what we do with mother plants is we actually keep it in a vegetative state. Um, we don't allow the plant to get to the flowering stage. And this is done by um, controlling the photo period. So uh, cannabis will flower once it reaches um, you know, around, I think, 12 hours uh, days, uh, 12 hour light cycles. So by keeping it in a 18 um, hour to 24 hour um, exposure to light, um, we can keep that in an indefinite vegetative state. Again, this is artificial, it is not natural. Um, so it's something actually that we were kind of curious and wanted us, made us want to research this. So what is the concern? Why did I do the research that I did? Um, the first main point is the accumulation of stomatic mutations. This is something that has been studied and seen in many different species that uh, essentially mutations will accumulate over time. Um, so next, we saw reports and we've talked to growers that there is a reduction in vigor and cannabinoid levels in clonal cuttings from aged mother plants. So we wanted to investigate if stomatic mutations could be the cause for this or a potential cause. And then lastly, um, in theory, clonal cuttings should be identical. However, this is not the case. Um, Essentially, in 1960s, a term called Mueller's ratchet was established, where it was uh, identified that in the absence of recombination, um, there would be an accumulation of irreversible deleterious mutations, which would increase the mutation load. So in this figure, you can see we start with our zygote, and these little thunderbolts relate to a uh, mutation. So as the cells divide, um, there's always a chance for a spontaneous mutation to occur. So certain cell lines might actually accumulate more mutations than others. But of course, as time goes on, this chance increases. So, and then this figure down here, uh, B is essentially showing the same thing that over time, um, you can accumulate these mutations. So this is what we, uh, we saw in the literature and this has been previously studied with many different um, plants. Mostly it's been done with perennial species um, and essentially they were able, these researchers and many other papers were able to identify genetic diversity within a single individual. Um, so this came with the term, a phenomenon was established named uh, called the genetic mosaicism hypothesis, uh, which is stating that um, plants are genetically diverse within an individual. Um, and it appears that there is a higher difference at the top than the bottom, which again, relates to that accumulation. Um, a lot of these papers use uh, molecular markers. So um, our paper, we were actually able to use whole genome sequencing. So um, it was nice to get a much detailed, uh, much more detailed uh, look into this phenomenon. Um, to quickly touch base on exactly what this genetic mosaicism hypothesis is, like I mentioned, it's a single individual that is genetically diverse, um, which means there's two or more cell lineages that are within and then this is, gives rise to different genotypes and possibly different phenotypes. So if you look at this figure on the left, we let's say have a purple mutation um, and it is eventually kind of carried on through the cell lines. And eventually you end up with a leaf that has two different groups of cells that in this case show two different phenotypes, right? The green and the purple. The image on the right, you can see the same kind of case, an actual leaf, a cannabis leaf where you have one coloring on the uh, left and one other coloring on the right. So again, this is two different groups of cells and this is the genetic mosaicism hypothesis. So a paper that really uh, kickstarted this uh, research was from Daiwan. It's the systematic genome sequencing differences among uh, leaf cells within individual trees. Uh, the researchers researched the Yoshino cherry tree and the beech tree. So essentially what they were able to, to, to distinguish 
to identify and distinguish is that there is genetic diversity within a individual tree and that this genetic difference increases as you go up the plant. So this uh, figure on the right shows um, the number one, the first number relates to the branch, and then the second number relates to um, that branch and then different leaves along that branch. So they're able to identify that there is an increase in genetic differences from the bottom to the top. When I first started my uh, literature review, um, this actually really stood out to me and really got me fascinated and kind of really interested in this topic was uh, the concept of uh, bud sports, uh, specifically uh, pink grapefruit. Um, when I was just doing my research in literature, um, I stumbled across this and was fascinated by that, that essentially in 1906 in Florida, um, the majority of grapefruits that existed at the time were of the Walters variety, which uh, contained a white inside. Um, and essentially in 1906, uh, Mr. Foster uh, was walking around on his uh, field and he noticed that uh, one branch of a tree particularly looked a bit strange to him. So he grabbed it and he cut it open and essentially he identified pink grapefruit. And essentially what occurred was there was a mutation that was unique to that branch and gave rise to a new phenotype. Um, this also ended up occurring in 1913, uh, the uh, Thompson Pink, um, where that was then grown out throughout the US and actually gave rise to the Ruby Red uh, grapefruit variety. Another bud sport, essentially the same thing where mutation occurred and gave rise to a new phenotype, which is now commercially available. It's been patented and uh, a lot of these uh, bud sports are actually on consumer shelves. So. This isn't unique to grapefruit. This has occurred in many, many different species and has given rise to many different uh, phenotypes and patents and um, products that we see on our shelves today. So um, another great image that I have here um, is essentially you'll see a mother tree that has a branch giving rise to the normal red kind of apples here, but a branch came off of there and actually had different uh, fruit color. And again, that is due to a spontaneous mutation um, that gave rise to a new phenotype. So here you can see the developing fruits. This is the mother tree and this is the bud sport. So again, this has happened in grapes, apples, pears, potatoes, um, many, many different cultivars and species. And it's, it's quite funny, honestly, that uh, there's breeders out there who uh, dedicate their lives into trying to find new cultivars and new phenotypes and have intense breeding programs. Um, and then nature just comes in and does its <laughs> natural thing. And it kind of sometimes outcompetes these, these breeders who dedicate their lives to uh, trying to get these new phenotypes and new cultivars. So it's quite interesting and funny that uh, nature finds a way to uh, introduce this to us. So just wanted to touch point on that. Lastly, I want to kind of touch point on uh, semiclonal variation. So while we've seen this does exist outside of the lab, this also occurs in vitro in the lab. Um, so this is another great figure which shows that if you were to take um, cells um, and they particularly were mutated and you introduce them into culture, um, you make give rise to new um, phenotypes, new plants. Um, and the same thing can happen if you take like normal cells uh, and get an explant from normal, and then mutations occur during that callus phase and the introduction into, um, into, to, into in vitro conditions can promote and can introduce a new variety or new uh, phenotype. So, so I wanna bring it back in to my research and why I did what I did. Um, that was kind of the background. And I just want to now get into you know, my paper and the research that I have done. So the main thing, right, it was the determine the location and the number of somatic mutations. We weren't really sure what we were going to see. Um, but by using whole genome sequencing, we were actually able to see quite a lot. So I'll get into that soon. Um, next, we want to confirm the genetic mosaicism hypothesis applies to cannabis. So it's a hypothesis that we have seen in other species, specifically perennials, so uh, we want to confirm. Uh, next is investigate the impact of keeping an annual uh, in, uh, as a perennial. So it's quite interesting to think that we are keeping this plant that naturally it normally only lives for you know, a year max, but we're keeping it up for a very, very long time. Um, some growers potentially, you know, a decade or something. Um, so we wanted to investigate that. Um, then we want to reveal possible causes of the reported decline of traits. Um, so we've sp spoken to growers and other people that 
there are a decrease uh, levels of cambioid level. And then also the plant health has shown to be poorer as the plant ages. So um, this is a potential reason for that. And then lastly, we want to uncover a potential best practice for keeping and renewing your mother plants. Um, when I say renewing your mother plants is there is a practice in cannabis where um, after around you know, two years, depending on the grower and their conditions, they will take a clonal cutting from their mother plant and then reestablish that as a new mother plant to uh, revigorate the plant. And uh, they will then have that as the new mother plant. So um, we want to uncover possible best practice for that. So for the methods on what we did uh, to complete this research, we collected samples from the bottom, the middle, and the top. Uh, we then performed DNA extraction and then used full genome sequencing using the Illumina NovaSec 6000, which gave us a over 50x depth of coverage, um, which I will get into in a second. Uh, and then we used bioinformatic tools to analyze the data. So um, what is this 50x depth of coverage? I'll first quickly touch on what whole genome sequencing involves. Right? We start with a very large DNA molecule and it is then fragmented. We then sequence those fragments and we overlap the fragments to essentially give us an assembled sequence. So, so when I talk about the 50x of coverage, what we have is if you look at a single spot on the chromosome, um, we have millions of these fragments that we are able to overlap and essentially by overlapping 50 over 50 unique um, reads we are able to essentially get a full genome with high confidence so now let's get into the actual results of what i found by full genome sequencing um, so this is a table from my paper where um, we have the number number of reads which is over 300 million reads which gave us steps of coverage over 50, the mapping rates over 90%. And then we have the type of mutations or variants, which are single nucleotide variants, multi-nucleotide variants, small, small insertions, and small deletions. Um, so it gave us a total of 3.4 million variants detected. And that was also after filtering and using bioinformatics to be confident of what variants were detected and shown. Um, so with that 3.4 million variants, we essentially created a Venn diagram that showed the overlapping and unique variants. Um, so essentially, we have the top with uh, over or near 600,000 variants were detected uniquely within the top, uh, 77,000 for the middle, and then the bottom, 147,000. And again, in the middle here, we have variants that were shared between all three samples, and these were shared, you know, between middle and top, or top and bottom, et cetera. So uh, figure C here, we have a phylogenic tree um, created using the neighbor joining method, uh, 100,000 bootstrap. Um, and again, we use the reference genome essentially as an outgroup to allow us to compare the three uh, samples that we took. So um, next, we looked into essentially um, the main categories of variants found. So were they actually genic or up and downstream or intergenic? Um, and then within that, were they exon, introns, or transcript? So that's what uh, figure A here shows. Um, figure B is what we uh, investigated in the uh, concept of high impact variants, which are variants that have a significant change to the um, to the actual function of that gene. Um, the most simple example would be, you know, a mutation that completely stops and does not allow uh, the gene to be transcribed. So that would be, you know, what we would categorize as a high impact variant. And then figure C here, uh, we have what kind of um, high impact uh, variants they were. So lastly, we looked into the pathways. I hope this isn't too intimidating to anyone, but uh, again, I won't get into all the nitty ditty greed and details of this, but essentially we looked at 44 genes in both the cannabinoid and terpene pathways, and we were investigating for any sort of high impact variants that existed within these. We did not find any high impact variants. However, we did find four genes that um, contained a more than double nucleotide diversity um, compared to the whole genome. So we uh, investigated the 
calculated the uh, nucleotide diversity for the whole genome and then compared um, for these genes and essentially these four genes, the OLS and the CBDAS, uh, HMGR and TPS9. Uh, those four genes essentially stood out as more than double the average of the nucleotide diversity. And again, this wasn't high impact mutations, but there were variants detected at these locations that were more than double than the average of the entire genome. So it again just kind of relates to this is something to consider. It's not doomsday, but it is something that people should be aware that these there are spontaneous mutations and they are occurring at or near these critical genes. So um, over time, potentially, maybe they actually would have had um, an actual impact uh, as these mutations continue to accumulate. Another thing um, that I want to mention is that the idea of mutational hot, hotspots. Um, current recent, really, really recent literature has essentially uh, suggested that mutations aren't random. Um, up to that paper, it was widely believed that mutations are completely random where they occur in the genome. Um, but new literature is suggesting that that isn't actually the case where mutations might be more prone to exist at certain locations within the genome. So, so that's something to consider. So to wrap up, um, essentially, we discovered genetic diversity within cannabis, a cannabis mother plant. So we can confirm that essentially the genetic mosaic mosaicism hypothesis applies to cannabis. Um, again, these mutations can impact the long term of genetic fertility, so the identicalness or exactness of a clone. Um, this is a possible explanation for why growers see a decline in their plant health or cannabinoid levels um, from aged mother plants. And then lastly, um, renewing a mother plant from a lower region uh, may actually reduce that accumulation of mutations. So as I mentioned, uh, growers will occasionally renew their mother plants by taking a clonal cutting. It seems like the norm is to usually take that from the top or the apical region. Um, so I'm suggesting and research shows that it may be best if you are doing this renewing process to take a clone from the middle or bottom, re uh, bottom region. So, and again, um, this research, it definitely did lack cultivars, uh, generational data and mutation rates and multiple replicates. Um, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> whole genome sequencing is expensive. Um, so we couldn't do as many samples or different cultivars as we'd like, um, but the results that we found were still, I believe, very significant and something to uh, build off of. So, so yeah, I'd like to just note the DOI of my published paper in the Plant Genome. I'd like to thank the Plant Genome for inviting me to this webinar. It is a great honor to present my research and my thesis. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my advisors, Dr. Max Jones uh, and then Dr. David Torquemene. And then obviously thank my funding uh, from Brant Med and NSERC. So thank you everyone for attending my presentation and it's been an honor. Thank you Christian for this nice presentation and we are open for the questions from the audience. I just received a few, I start with one. Uh, what else could cause the quality of the mother plants to decline over time? Great question. So we investigated uh, stomatic mutations. Um, I think the other two major um, concerns are epigenetics. Um, epigenetics is the world where genes are not necessarily changed, but their expression is. So some genes may be turned on or off. Um, we see this um, with aging. So that could be uh, one of the other possibilities. Um, next would be viruses and bacteria. So as a plant gets older, uh, it is more prone to be disrupted by uh, a virus or a bacteria that can essentially cause that decline in cannabinoid levels or plant health. Thank you. One more question is that what, what can we do to preserve the genetics? A uh, great question. Um, so there was that best practice that I mentioned where maybe taking from a lower region might, uh, you know, kind of preserve those genetics a bit more. Um, another thing would be actually to keep um, plant material of your mother uh, in an in vitro clean environment. So by keeping your genetics in a clean environment, you don't risk the, um, the viruses, bacteria um, from actually um, 
affecting your plant, or at least you have a backup um, of plant material to go to. And then there's also the world of cryopreservation, where you would freeze your plant material so that you preserve those genetics. Um, so if your mother plant were to get sick or die or whatever, you do have a backup storage. Thank you. Uh, another question. Would cereally creating a new mother plant every season for four seasons result in fewer mutations than keeping the same mother plant for four seasons? Do you plan to test that? Um, we don't have any current plans to test that, but in my belief, I would uh, estimate that renewing your mother every growing season would actually promote more um, spontaneous mutations as essentially when you do this renewing process, there's a lot of like um, a burst of growth that occurs. And essentially as there's more quick growth, there's more chance for that uh, spontaneous mutations to occur. So if you were to have a single individual for that entire season, um, these plants don't grow that quick or as quick. Um, so that would be my belief. Great question. Okay, thank you. Another question, how about mutations in roots? I would expect more mutation due to the induction of Adventist roots with cuttings. Uh, sorry, what was that second part of the question? Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, the question is, how about mutations in roots? Right. And uh, it's asking, I would expect more mutations due to the induction of Adventist uh, roots with cuttings. OK. Yeah, no, roots is a great question. That's something actually originally was interested in looking at, but um, as anyone who's tried to do research on roots, it's extremely, extremely difficult to actually, um, one, to even get to the roots and kind of like organize them to actually take a sample from. Um, it's a very invasive and destructive process to take any sort of um, samples from the roots. So uh, it's not something we've looked into. I wanted to look into it with clonal cuttings, um, but, um, it's something essentially, yeah, I believe there would be mutations existing there. The same kind of concept is applying where as there's growth, there's always a chance for a spontaneous mutation to occur. So um, again, and these mutations accumulate. So the further the root would be, uh, the more mutated or more mutations that that would uh, contain. Thank you. Um, the other question is, what are your thoughts on why there were more mutation at bottom than middle? Yes, yeah, if, uh, if anyone did notice, I'll actually bring up the uh, slide here again, um, here. Um, we did see that the middle did contain actually the least amount of variants. Um, and I think the main reasons why we, our research uh, group uh, believes this is essentially the pruning practice that is done with maintaining mother plants. So with this image here, you can see that uh, growers usually like to completely prune down um, their plants. And essentially this pruning uh, most likely affects plant hormones and the growth. So um, I believe that has something to do with that where um, essentially the middle is least disrupted. It isn't really, that, that's not where clonal cuttings are usually taken from. Um, the top is where those clonal cuttings are taken from and there's more growth and this bottom is you know pruned. So there's just more, um, more going on in the bottom and the top than the middle. So I think that is why we see this lower number of uh, variants. And again, this phylogenic tree, we see that the bottom and top uh, are more uh, genetically uh, similar than the middle because of the differences that are greater there. But great question, thank you. Thank you. Last chance for the last question. Yeah, we're going for the last question. Is there a way to quantify the distribution of mutation? Is it possible to know whether the mutations you found are shared in the same shoot or they are a combination of different mutation in different tissues? Right, um, it's most likely they're different mutations and different shoots. Essentially, we were only able to look at three of the uh, samples, um, even in this image here. This is the honey banana, um, much older. But uh, we have the one sample here, another sample here, and another one that's right up there, I believe. Um, so they are off of different shoots and whatnot. Um, 
like the Daiwan paper that I mentioned earlier, where they worked on the Yoshino cherry tree and the beech tree, they were able to actually look at specific branches and then leaves along that branch. And they were able to identify the same thing where as you go further along that shoot, um, there is more genetic differences as well. So we didn't look at it into this research, um, but other uh, literature has suggested that yes, that uh, phenomenon occurs um, within the shoot as well. Thank you, Christian. Thank it's you again for joining us for today's webinar and to Mr. Ademik for sharing his research. As a reminder, the recording will be made available and sent to all attendees soon. Thank you again and have a great day.